And now, folks, great pleasure to introduce investigative journalist, long-time anti-West ASC activist, and over recent years, great colleague, Wendy Bacon. And to her left, all right, civic hacker and open source data designer, Luke Bacon. Yes, they are related. <laughs> Uh, whose recent work together has focused on analysing available data and on the roadside and construction impacts of Westconnex on air quality. Wendy and Luke will also tell us about a great new citizen science initiative. So please welcome Wendy Bacon and Luke Bacon. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having us. It's a real um, pleasure and, and thanks, Noel. That was yeah, really, really interesting. At the, from the outset, I think... Uh, it's really important for us to, again, as they did already, uh, acknowledge the Gadigal Wangal people of the Oro Nation as the traditional custodians of this beautiful place that we're in. And I think that the analysis of what's going on and of, you know, of doing this to land in Sydney again is really connected to that settler colonial history. And as Noel brought in, an analysis of um, inequality and social justice and decolonizing really, I, I think, is essential for you know, dealing with this situation and thinking about alternatives. Um, so Mum and I have been kind of doing a few different projects about West Connex <laughs> for a few years, since about 2015, and we actually, start, what's some of the first stuff we were doing was looking at the contracts. And if, if, I haven't kind of looked into that in a while, but if anyone here is interested in that follow the money and looking at the contracts, um, I'd be, I, I could point you in the right direction to kind of get a whole lot of that information. And really after we did that work, they made them secret. So we haven't been able to do that yes. more recently. Yes, but yeah, we could talk more about that. But anyway, in the, the beginning of the year, we, we started talking about air quality um, because, uh, um, because Mum realize, was realising that was increasingly a really important issue. Um, and this is, you know, this is what we're talking about. This is the West Connects construction. We're talking less about what's in the tunnels and more about um, the, the areas around where the roads are coming out, the impacts of having heaps more cars on the road and having a policy that is, relies on that logic, uh, and also the construction impacts of, of what's happening every day. But I think it also points to bigger air quality issues in Sydney where we do have relatively really good air quality a lot of the time, but local um, impacts like construction and like roads are having a really big impact on people's lives and it's not really understood very well. So what we're talking about, um, I'm going to kind of introduce of, of what we've been doing, then Mum's going to talk about some of the stories. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the project we're doing now that you'll be able to be a, a critical part of. We're primarily concerned with particulate pollution. Um, there's a really good Wikipedia article on particulate pollution that I recommend people checking out. But basically, it's really, 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 really small bits of dust and all kinds of stuff. And it's so dangerous because uh, your lungs do don't really have filters to deal with, with um, particles that small. And it can get directly into your bloodstream and, and is, is very bad from there, as you can imagine. And in Australia, um, as part of this, we've been trying to think about you know, what, what safeguards do we have, what regulation do we have. Um, one of those things is the national uh, air quality measure and the standards, um, just to kind of give you an idea of like what in Australia are considered, you know, what's, what's really bad and what's okay. Um, for PM 2.5, which is the really, some of the really, really tiny particulate um, particles that we'll be talking about. It's eight, um, and that measure is micrograms per cubic meter. So eight uh, micrograms per cubic meter over a year on average. Um, is that way, if it goes over that, that's considered a, an exceedance of our national standards. It's totally unclear to me uh, what that means. The government says they're legally binding standards, but I'm not sure in what sense anyone could be held accountable for an exceedance of the measure, and that's a real issue, generally. So when we're talking about, um, in, in this area, we could also have a great, um, this is actually from West Connexus map, and it's not, there's obviously down the road where there's gonna be a whole lot of um, action going on, but this is a bit further down the road in Haberfield, where those tunnels are gonna emerge, and where all that construction's going on at the moment. So there's a whole lot of cars gonna be coming out there, and that's a view of the construction at the moment, or recently. Um, because of these stacks are going to go up and there's all this um, work going on, the, um, as part of the approval process, West Connects have had to monitor the air quality around their construction sites. 
Uh, and this is on uh, along between the end of the M4 and uh, in Haberfield, Haberfield Public School. There, it turns out there's six air quality monitoring sites in operation right now, and they've been operating since last December. December, to, they have to do it for one year before the tunnel goes into operation. Yeah. And so this is partly how we got interested in this, because mum started looking at uh, this site that they put up where you can see, um, you can actually see what the air quality is. There's real problems with this setup, because as you can notice, there's no monitors south of Parramatta Road. So when the wind's blowing in that direction, you know, who knows what's going on? Uh, and there's a whole lot of flats there. These so flats are up near um, Homebush. All yeah. right, so that's there's a, bit a huge number of people living around the stack in Homebush. Yeah, um, I've got my own. Okay. Mic. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but one of the problems with, and again, this comes back to that idea Noel was talking about of treating the public as, as a sophisticated stakeholder who have serious interest and um, an expert knowledge, where this, this is what's put up by um, the subcontractor to the contractor to the Sydney Motor Motorway Co Corporation, where they have on the left here, you can see the particulate matter and other pollutants. Um, and you can see for a 10 minute reading what their reading was, and then you can never see that reading again, and you can see the next 10 minutes. So there's no way to get any historical view on how it's changing over time, and it also makes it impossible to, to compare to some of the other monitors in Sydney, which are done on a, an hourly average. So that's a problem. And so what we did is we wrote a little bit of software that goes, and this is called a web scraper, and it's, it's something that I've got a lot of experience with, but other people, if you know software developers, this is something we can do as a community to get a bit more information. And just for fun, I will explain to you how it works. It basically is a little uh, robot that says, go visit that website. And when you're on the website, go through that sidebar table and for each location, create this record that has the PM, uh, and the C2O, uh, so the carbon concentration and all the different measurements. That's basically what they're doing. And it runs every 10 minutes. And we've been running that since... March May, the 18th. March the 18th. So we've actually have been getting their data. And this is what it looks like. Yeah. And I might say, um, I can't do this, but Luke <laughs> being a yeah. younger, sort of open data journalism person, yeah, can do this, and it is something that data journalists uh, all should be able to do. Yeah, and also, I mean, this is produced by a subcontractor to the government. There are government agencies who claim they're unable to get this information, but we have this information, <laughs> and nobody paid me to do it, and they're, you know, they have a lot of money and a lot of resources, and they claim to be unable to do it, which I don't think is really credible. Um, but anyway, this is the data that we get, and so it looks, you know, if you've ever seen a spreadsheet, this is not unfamiliar. So Mum's now going to talk a bit about why this is useful. So what was what was done with this over the last few months? I've got my own mic. Okay. I think can people you hear me? Wayne, I've got my own mic, haven't I? That's for the um, that's oh, for the video. But this okay. Is for the okay. Right. I'll do this. Okay. Um, why is this useful? Well, as Luke said, um, the data disappears uh, pretty quickly off the site. You can. Um, actually do some searches on the site. Initially they were 30 days, but they don't provide any, they're line graphs. Um, they're quite um, tricky, actually. There's a lot of problems with the website, which Ecotech themselves uh, admit. But I just want to give you this story as an example, and we published this as a story on um, my website this week, wendybacon.com. So if you look, uh, there's actually a little video of this. So Sharon Laura, who's been a very active person in her community in Haverfield since 2013 on this issue. She goes out of a house into Bland Street, which is just opposite Haverfield Public School. And you can probably see down the road at Parramatta Road, which is very close to the construction site, there's a lot of dust there. If you watch the video, 45 second video, and unfortunately she only got 45 seconds, you can actually see the dust all swirling around. And parents, it was about time when parents were picking up the kids from school, everybody is absolutely talking about their getting mouthfuls of dust, it's going all through the schoolyard, and there are kids around there who've been diagnosed as asthmatics um, who the parents are very concerned about. So, so this was a very dramatic event, it was a very um, uh, worrying event for many people. So um, if you go to the next slide, Luke, yes. Yeah, so, as you could see, um, I was taking at this stage, and by then Sharon and others were too, a lot of screenshots off that website. 
so that we would have the actual data because otherwise what you're seeing there, 406 p.m. 10, now of course you can go higher than that, the limit on the average for the day is uh, 50, 406 is very high, particularly if you're striking levels like that over a couple of hours. So we had that screenshot. Now, uh, when she got home, Sharon wrote off, and it's a whole complaint system with the um, Sydney Motorway Corporation. Now, the Sydney Motorway Corporation has contracted CBB contractors, who are the main contractors, who have contracted Ecotech. So it's a long trail, uh, but Sharon wrote an email quickly to uh, CBB contractors, and they, the next day, responded to her. They blamed a dust storm that surrounded the whole of that area on two grass blowers. And then, but just to be sure that it wasn't too ludicrous, they then said that this was a regional event with 60 kilometre miles through, uh, kilometre winds through Sydney, and um, that all the six monitors had a similar spike. Okay, and that all unrelated stations kilometres away also did. Now, nothing is going to be similar, as actually Noel said. There's always going to be some differences. So it's a fairly silly statement. So what we did, what I would say Luke and our colleague Anari Dagan did, was using that spreadsheet you saw before, they then can, from that, set up a thing where you can get the hourly averages and then we can compare the hourly averages. And this graph, you can just, basically all you need to see now is the spikes going up and the two spikes of the two Haberfield monitors. You will see that indeed there was a regional event. Levels did go up, but nowhere did they go up as nearly as far as they did in Haberfield and they stayed there over an extended period of time. So that's just the six Ecotech monitors. But it is possible, what um, CPB contractors were also saying was that right across Sydney, this was happening. It was happening everywhere in the same way. So this shows you a, a map of the uh, OEH, that's Office of Environment and Heritage Monitors that are scattered around Sydney. As the Deputy Mayor of, of uh, the city said recently, Jess Miller, she said that none of these monitors, and this is very important to realise, none of them are near roadsides. Now, there may be, that may be the right way to do it, but it does mean we don't know what pollution in Sydney is near roadsides. So this is, so what we then, you can do, and any of you could do this, you go to the OEH site, you find the search engine, it's actually quite a good search engine, the next day you can actually get the hourly levels across Sydney, and we then uh, compared those, and I can tell you, or we haven't got a graph on that, but I can tell you that Haberfield was higher than anywhere else in Sydney. So what we've got here is CBB contractors pushing back on the residents, telling them this. It's a long and time-consuming uh, thing to do a complaint. That is very defeating if someone tells you that. And how are you going to prove them wrong? Well, now, with doing what we're doing, we can, to some extent, provide evidence that I've sent all this off to the EPA, who I'm meant to be investigating. Now, just for a minute, we'd like to talk about St Peter's a little bit. And I think Peter Ross from St Peter's may be here today, but St Peter's Public School have had a monitor uh, for the EIS purposes. Some of you know the massive construction site there. They've had one since 2015. In writing, um, West Connex Delivery Authority was then told the parents they would have the results of this monitoring sent to them. That has been going since 2015. To this day, they have never got that monitoring. And the Education Department will not lift a finger to assist that process. In fact, they very panically, in a very panicked way, tell me that it all belongs to S Sydney Motorway Corporation, so we can't know about that. OK, so um, about, um, well, many, many months late, they published monthly reports which came from the e uh, EIS. These are PDFs, so you actually have to be able to go through them and construct your own Excel out of the results that you read. Now, for many months, the residents in St Peter's have been complaining about the dreadful effects of the construction impacts. This is just one little indication that they were right. And without this sort of data, it's very hard for them. They've got some medical evidence, but otherwise to prove it. So what this chart... Um, Luke did this chart, we um, got the, it was just basic Excel turned into a line graph, 
the first peak you can see at the beginning of the line, that's when they did all the land for the asbestos removal or the, the major earth movements around the site. Then went down while the, before the construction started during the approval process and then you can see at the beginning of 2017 it rose. It was above any of the OEH monitors throughout Sydney last year, these averages. And then in 2018 it's gone really higher. And if you live down there, intuitively you know that that is what's happening. But without the community having this data, you can't produce that. And I, I think also what's quite significant here is that, so this is WestConnex produced data, and it shows that there has been an exceedance of the federal standards, like, and which are meant to be legally binding. So what, you know, there's this whole question, well, and then what, what do we do, what happens? I'm sure people in this room might have ideas about that, but you know, this, is, this is an example where there's existing evidence of an exceedance. Yeah, what, anyway, what next? So you see the year is uh, above 25. That's meant to be for PM10, the average for the year. Okay, look, the other good thing that you can do using this is, look, um, any monitoring is going to have issues. There is going to be no perfect or similar sort of mo measurement, uh, I guess, whatever it is you're measuring. But, um, you know, people say, okay, like one of the, one of the really worrying things that this all this data is in the hands of the Sydney Motorway Corporation, CBB contractors and Ecotech. The community has no ac full access to this data at all, other than very, very superficial monthly reports. So we noticed that one weekend that the, the nitrogen dioxide levels were way up. Um, so I reported this to the residents who reported to the education department and uh, they did get on to uh, Sydney Motorway Corporation and they came back and said it was an error um, it was due to a faulty technical device. They'd replaced it, but that one was faulty too. Uh, now, that is not reassuring. I accept that that was probably an error. But on the other hand, how would I really know? Um, look, um, I'll, I'll just do this little yeah, bit yeah, here. Yeah. Um, there's a huge amount of data in the EIS reports. They come up to about there if you put them on top of each other. The really serious information is buried in the technical appendices. It's bloody hard to read. The maps are hard to read. The graphs are hard to read. But um, what we've got up here is, and of course one of the things that we're doing, and I really want to get some of this to the parliamentary inquiry, is that we need to test the results of the EIS. We need to see how the predictions work out. And I know that independent consultants working for the councils and in fact, I kind of realised that Noel was one of those that not on the M4 but the M5 had actually warned about all of this, had actually said that this is what could happen. And so we need to now see if in fact they were right or they were wrong. Not just, yes, you know, don't you worry, dear, which is very, very apt, I think, Noel. So, okay, that one up there just shows you um, that they predict there will be no daily exceedances of the PM10 goals uh, at any stage, 2021, 2031. The one below just shows you the exceedances up to July this year at um, Ramsey Street in Haberfield. So yeah, we could count those, but basically this is the work that's got to be done to compare their claims with the reality. They of course then claim, of course there's all the regional effects and there's a lot, that is the dominant thing, the regional effects bushfires and all that sort of thing. You've then got to go through the data and exclude what is similar. But what I'm finding is that the mixture, I think it's with the perhaps smoke from bushfires with all the combustion that's making the levels much higher near the roads. Now, I'm not a chemist, so I can't say that, but that's one of the things we need expert advice on. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, yeah, as Mum's saying, the main thing this shows is that there's a prediction that's never going to exceed. And this is this year it already exceeds. So the modelling seems to predict that it, while having many more cars on the road, air quality is going to get better somehow, um, which seems really ludicrous. So just quickly, this is part of just an example quickly to, to give you an idea of why it's so important for us as a community to have you know, much better air quality data and what we can start doing with it. So this, this was just get it, feeding in a lot of that data. I think this was for Haberfield Public School. Um, that we're getting from those WestConnex monitors with our web scrapers. And this is the, this is the hourly averages for, for the period that we've been collecting. And I think what's significant here, if, if you talk to um, uh, doctors about air quality, 
One problem they have with the standards is that they're based on annual and monthly averages, but there's increasing evidence that shows a one-off event of really bad exposure can be really damaging to your health. And it's not necessarily the ambient you know, level over a month that is damaging. Um, yeah, it can be one-offs. And the other thing is if, you're, um, if, if you go to school or Haverfield Public School, it's not really significant to you that the air quality is slightly better in the middle of the night which contributes to those monthly averages. It's significant to you that the air quality is such and such a level when you're there during the day. The, as far as I've seen, the government and none of the contractors are doing any of that kind of analysis, but it's actually not very hard to do once you actually have the data. And so things like this where we can say, well, this is PM10, is significantly higher during the afternoon and in the morning when people are dropping off their kids and during the day. So is, is that relevant to take into account? I mean, these, these are questions for doctors, but these are the types of questions the community is asking and asking for more rigor and sophistication. And just quickly... Um, this is, yeah. Yeah. This we'll, is yeah. the Ramsey Street monitor. So this is over in Ramsey Street, Haberfield, after eight plus, like eight and a half months monitoring uh, since last December. And you can see there's a fairly even line running across there now. Uh, which probably reached that level uh, towards the end of July, and you can see it is now and has been. Now, it may go down That's later in the year. Or we can't predict that. But it is currently above 12. That is a long way above the Australian standard of 8. We're meant to be aiming for 7, not 12. I think people would be concerned about that. And, and that is yeah. way above anything predicted. And uh, we actually had a conversation with, with somebody who works in public health in the government uh, and said to them, you know, they said, well, we, we asked them, if the, if the results so far seem to be significantly different from the monitoring, would that be a public health concern? And is 50% higher than the, the uh, required standard, is that a significant difference? And they said, yes, that's a very significant difference. So, so there are big concerns here. So we have all this data, we're asking all these questions, one issue that we keep seeing and coming back to the beginning of the also the issue with the placement of these monitors by Ecotech is that we're also picking up all these negative results that, um, that are an indication of errors with their monitors. So, are, so even though we are able to ask interesting questions with that data, there's real problems with it. So what have we been doing? Now let me grab this out and maybe if you can pass this around, let's start there. So, and I'll kind of explain what this is as we go. So we started thinking, well, what would it mean to set up our own monitoring and for the community to start monitoring? Because clearly, it, you know, the government ones are inadequate and, um, you know, for West Quinnex to do their own monitoring is clearly a conflict of interest and, and is in, inadequate. So, you know, the community has to start getting together and doing this. Hanari Deegan, our you know, colleague who's working on this with us, who's a, a great civic hacker as well, he found this, this project and, and started kind of putting these together. So this is all based on this project Hanari found and, and he's, you know, he's interested in talking about uh, why we picked this particular project, but we won't go into that now. But in Stuttgart in Germany, they had a similar issue with roads and air pollution and the community got together and started building their own air quality monitors. It's all open source, it's all free information for us to use and so we're building our project off that. So a few weeks ago, Jess Miller, who's the Deputy Mayor for the City of Sydney, put together a hackathon about uh, air quality in Sydney because it's something she's very concerned with. She doesn't feel like she has adequate information to make planning decisions. There are no government air quality monitors in the City of Sydney. There's going to be hundreds of thousands more cars on the, on the south end with Sydney Park and there's no air quality monitoring there. So she's quite concerned about this, wants people to get out and, uh, and you know, start fixing the situation. So instead of kind of sitting in a room and hacking there, we went and got on the bus <laughs> and we came down to Callan Street and, uh, and we had a it's great... David. There's <laughs> David. Hi, David. And, uh, and we had a, real, a really good chat to some of you people here who are really concerned about air quality. And we talked a bit about this monitor that we're making and Hanari did a great demonstration of some of the data. And we put one up. So we, you know, there's those seven government monitors or 15 throughout the whole Greater Sydney region. Now there's one in Cowan Street and there's one a few streets over in Club Street and we're trying, starting to build out this local network. And that's us putting it up and that's 
what it looks like. So just, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're thinking. So this is, there's actually two there in Roselle now, um, and that's the average, and there's one in Erskineville, there's one in Marrickville, but we, we really need to get a lot of these monitors out. And Jess was talking about like thousands and thousands in Sydney. Um, I th let's start with 100, but like let's, let's, let's really do this. Let's build this people's air quality monitoring network. This is Germany, where the project comes from. So there's heaps. Uh, just coming back to Sydney, it, it would be great to really have that kind of sophisticated information. Imagine the better you know, planning we can do. And so um, there's one of them just going around to give you an idea of what they look like. We, we want to install these in people's places, and if you're interested, you could also be involved with building them and helping install them. Um, like yesterday at our house, I think both Chris Nash and I think Charlie Pierce, who's an environmental scientist yeah. who's been fantastic, who's helping us. I think we built, I personally didn't, um, 15 of these little monitors. Yeah, yeah and, and, and I should also mention Charlie They only cost $50 each. And, and Chris Nash, um, who also really involved in this, um, but you can, if you go to that link, um, so is.gd slash sid underscore pollution underscore monitor, that actually links you to another link, which is the, the longer proper link to this form, um, which, which people can fill in if they're interested in having a monitor in their, their place, which I think would be really great. Um, there's a few things on there, like it'd be great to have a PowerPoint outside and we need Wi-Fi to, um, to connect to the internet with them. Um, they're about $50, which compared to the Ecotex, Ecotex charging us $100,000 to run that monitor, which is, is a lot more sophisticated than this one, but you know, this does a pretty good job of PM2.5. Uh, yeah, we, we can get as many as we can out there and, and you know, And build what we really yeah. need is people, um, like, we can do a lot of different ones, but we do need people beside roads, and we do, yes, including shops, potentially, that sort of thing. Yes, and in probably in their front yards, some people might also have them in their backyards, but um, yeah, we can really be very flexible in, um, in what we can do. And I think that the really good thing, and it will take more resources to do that level of analysis we'd be able to do, but like right now I can get any of this anywhere in the world on my phone and the Ecotech ones as well, and I can do a quick check and I can tell you right now that the air pollution along the M4, near the M4 is, and all those residents are being exposed to more air pollution than people in back streets in Roselle at the moment. That's just like very, very unscientific, quick snapshot. Um, but I think it's Im the important thing is for us to get control of the data, to be treated seriously like stakeholders. And it is interesting that the people in Stuttgart, I think there are now some uh, legal cases happening mm out of it, out of the data that they've collected too. So, you know, we have to take some sort of control over our own lives. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, before we've got a few questions, let's, um, let's roll. Who's got a question for Wendy and Luke? Anybody? Yeah. Um, if you have an outdoor um, PowerPoint, um, uh, what height do you need because uh, of course low down is where little children are exposed so it can be at different levels yeah I think the more the merrier is the idea and, and what, what kind of results were they getting in Stuttgart that led to this uh, uh, response I, I, don't, I don't know enough about that full story but they've actually reached out and want to talk to us about it which is great and it would be great for us to be able to contribute back to their project as well but I know they um, in turn, I, I think it's also really important to focus on not just getting the data, but turning that into political action and you know an actual change in decision making. Um, but in Stuttgart, I know, which, which is a big center of um, German car manufacturing, they've banned um, old diesel cars in part of the city now, um, which I think is part of this whole movement there. So that's that you know that's really serious political change in a in a place that is really part of the car industry. So and Stuttgart is a big car city, so it's probably suffering from worse air quality, I think, than some other parts of Germany. So that probably instigated plus some available real open data people. Yeah. And I guess uh, one of the things just want to make clear is that all the results of these are instantly available. They actually take every five seconds, I think, uh, measurements. Um, but ultimately, we have access to all that data, like anybody can. It's open data. 
and the sort of thing you saw where we did the hourly averages, we can do our own work like that. And as we're putting in the monitors, we'll get the NSE information on, like, is this near a road? Is it near a construction site? To be able to later do meaningful analysis with the information. Mm. Yeah, um, so there are, because there's 5,000 of these deployed around the world, and, um, and in fact the uh, Code for Germany and Code for Stuttgart who are making these, they're quite connected with uh, the scientific community. So they're doing analysis. As I understand, oh, maybe I'll grab the microphone back actually. Um, so, uh, so it's, there's, yeah, there's interesting issues about, uh, as we've been learning about, um, Accuracy, is it on? Can you hear me? No? No? It should, just be, it should be on. Hello? Hello? No? no. no. Hello? No? Oh. It's not good. Maybe, gonna maybe I can just talk up very loudly. <laughs> um, accuracy and air quality monitoring. So in all air quality monitoring, um, and as you've seen with the expensive Ecotech ones, there are issues. Can they be used in a court case is a really good question. As I understand it, these monitors, like aren't recommended to be used in a court case, but I think I, that was in a you know in courts in Germany potentially. I've heard also from environmental lawyers that um, citizen science projects aren't good enough to to be part of court cases. But I personally think that really needs thought because given that you know, the government's spending $20 billion based on these ecotech ones that seem really problematic. There's also analysis that the OEH um, government ones are not positioned correctly to do proper monitoring. So... Or re realistic yeah. monitoring for a lot of residents. So I think that's an important question that, that, that needs really, you know, serious thought, not just about this kind of network, but also about the existing government network. And we are going to do some testing. I don't know, Charlie, are you here? Yeah, I don't, anyway, Charlie may not be here, but um, we are going to do some comparison testing with these monitors. But ultimately, what we will be able to see is trends and comparisons in different places. And I can say that of the five we've got put in, they, they are behaving as they should behave, if you know what I mean. They're going up and down and at the same times and are generally less than the other ones. Everything that you would expect. But at the end of the day, uh, we're not going to hold everything until we've done that, but we obviously want to be as um, scientific in our approach as we can be. And I think, just because this is such a big issue, I'll just say one more thing on it. Um, I think, I mean, there are so many scientists in the community, but also in universities, and also in the government uh, and, and the private sector who could use this type of information and do experiments with these types of monitors already. I think if there are people here who know environmental scientists who could do analysis, who are much more qualified than I am, or you know, we are to do that kind of analysis, that would be really, really good to, because we can get all the data for all these monitors and, and pass those out. One more? One more? Hi, Luke and Wendy, thank you very much. Uh, your data scraper mm. is an excellent tool. Um, as Noel mentioned, uh, the North Connex, which is the first of these long tunnels, so the only one from which we will have real data turning up, is now put back to 2020. Okay. We were expecting it to come online sometime mid up next year, but it won't. But we do in Australia have one long tunnel over 5k between end stacks, no filtration on the end stack, longitudinal through the middle, relatively highly trafficked, open now. It's in Brisbane, it's the airport link, which is a 6.5k tunnel. And God bless whoever it was in the Queensland equivalent of EPA or planning. They couldn't get filters mandated, but they got very, very good air quality monitoring mandated. That tunnel and the Clean 7, which is a smaller tunnel, are being monitored for all the big five pollutants inside the tunnels and at five mm. ambient stations. That data is live on the Go Via network site. Could you look at getting your data scraper up there? Because it's the same issue. 
you get real-time tracking. Yeah. You can see the picker pick, um, picks, but unless you grab a screenshot, it's gone. And then on the 24-hour averages and the monthly reports, it's all washed out while they're not in the piece. Yeah. If we could get something like that software up there on that, that's then real information to present going forward saying, this is the only operation of this technology allegedly for long travels in Australia, and this is what it's showing. Yeah. That starts to be really powerful. Because the other problem we've got is, of course, they will measure it through the year before the tunnel's open. It may end up being a bit longer than a year because these tunnels will keep getting delayed. But of course, they're measuring in a period where air quality <coughs> is worse than it is today because of construction events. Yeah, yeah and this is where we've got to be able to say, oh, the tunnel hasn't made it worse than it was during construction. We want to know the tunnel won't make it worse than it is today out there with yeah. no tunnel. Actually, I think um, one of the most insulting things I think about this is that this air monitoring has been done and we already showed it's like not at all on the west and it's not at all on the south. But when people are asking them, they're just saying, oh, this is baseline, we don't need to look at this. You know, as if you wouldn't want to look at what you're starting with and do some analysis of that. So they're just very, very not interested. But actually, while they're doing that two years after the tunnel opens in Haberfield, they, if they get to go ahead with stage three, they're going to be doing construction non-stop. So unless you do some analysis, how do you actually know what you're getting anyway? So I find that just so revealing in terms of their own attitude. Yeah, and I'll just show this. I think if I could just say one thing to oh, yeah. Chris Nash, I'm the, not the people who are sitting around the kitchen table assembling <laughs> monitors. Um, two things. One is that if you can put together an IKEA flat pack, you can put together one of these models. Yes. Uh, so you need that level of uh, yeah. confidence. So not everybody. <laughs> no, that's not everybody, but if you yeah. can do that, you can do this. Yeah. And the second thing is that while they're cheap and while, as Luke said, there's debate about all citizen science, uh, these are not Mickey Mouse monitors. They, there is an academic literature about the calibre of these um, monitors. Of this specific they're one. They're particularly good yeah. for 2.5. Not quite as good for CM10, but they're particularly good for 2.5. Yeah. So I, I know there's other people waiting, but I'm, we're running out of time. I think we'll have to encourage people to come to the tax floor. We're going to the tax floor very soon. Please join us. We'll can continue. I, can but I say one thing on the web scraping? Yes, please. So just, just one thing on the web scraping, because um, that's a really good question. Um, web scrapers are, are some of the most basic software development to do, and if there's anyone here who is a software developer or who, would, who is serious about learning software development, I would be happy to take people through that because there's, there's so much web scraping that needs to be done, um, and yeah, and it's very easy to do and it's free to do and blah, 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 but yeah. Um, yeah, so if anyone wants to do that, come and talk to me, maybe at the pub. And anyone here who's a scientist or wants to put together monitors or wants to help coordinate the placement. That's one thing we're really looking for, someone who's got a bit of time to coordinate a, just an online sort of situation. Um, yeah, please let us know. We just want to involve as many people as possible. Please thank Wendy and Luke for a great presentation.